It's a great privilege to be here this morning to share with you on prayer. I've still got a long ways to go in it. I haven't arrived. And uh, what I've found is that as I compare myself with you, I look pretty good. Don't I? You don't? But as long, but what the deal is, whenever I begin to compare myself to Jesus Christ, I see how far I've still got to go. There's some things that are very important in prayer. I think that this is one of the greatest needs probably in the world today is for God's people to be on their knees and praying and asking God for direction in their lives and for the church and for the different things that is important. And I've found that it is very important for me to have a quiet time when I get alone with God and let Him speak to me. He says, Be still and know that I am God. That's found in the 46th chapter of the Psalms, the 10th verse. Be still. And you know what? I've found that I'm a can-do person. I want to be out there doing all the time. And I just have to fight with myself to make the time where I really get alone and relax in the presence of the Lord. This morning when I got out of bed, God spoke to me, and I'll be sharing some of this with you in the message. But I've found when I get in His presence, He speaks to me in a new way every day he wants us to have a freshness in our life i remember one day when i got up and i went uptown to get the mail and people look at me and they'd kind of snicker and i want they'd look at me and they'd snicker and i begin to wonder well what had happened so i go home and look in the mirror and in the morning, you know, whenever I get my hair, I take and put water on it and get it there, and I'd forgot the comb that morning. And that's the way I looked. But I find that if I don't spend time with God in the morning, I go out into the presence of the people, and I wonder if they look at me and wonder, can I see Christ in Him? And that's one of the things that's so important for me as an individual to make sure that I ha am in the presence of Him and have a time for Him to just be able to speak to me and fill my heart with His presence. And there's so many times in the morning, if I don't have this time, sometimes I have to get up and do something. On Thursday of this coming week, I've got to, want to be in Ruston at 7.30. And I don't plan to leave at night to go over there to get there. But I just know that that time I won't have the time. But when I'm in my car, that can become a sanctuary with the Almighty God. A lot of times people today will say, well, I have to drive for 45 minutes to work. Well, you know what? You can spend that 45 minutes listening to the Scriptures if you want to. You can find it on your phone. You can go to the store and buy you and my I Bible. That's what I've got. I love to listen to it. I love to read along with it because I'm an audio learner. And so I have to deal with myself on this, but it's so important. It is a real challenge for all of us to have this quiet time with the Lord. But I want to tell you, I don't care your age. I believe you as a child, no matter when you get to where you can begin to understand and hear the presence of the Lord and feel Him there talking to your heart, I believe you need a quiet time just to sit down and say, God, I know you have a message for me today. And listen to His voice. Learn to listen to it when you're very young. And you'll hear the voice over and over and over I know there's people believe today that God doesn't speak to you. I want to tell you something. They don't have their antenna up or something. There's a problem because God still speaks today. And he wants you to hear the message that he has for you. And the message is going to be, I love you. I care about you. I want your life to bring honor and glory to my name today. And as you live your life out before me, you'll find that he's there. 
with a special presence. You won't look like your hair is all messed up up here. You'll see Jesus shining in your heart and in your life. And I believe they'll even see it in your eyes whenever you as an individual are in the presence of the Almighty. But it's a real challenge. I remember as I was trying to learn how to really develop this quiet time with the Lord, I used to go to a meeting with the navigators over near Enid. They had a place there, I think it was Mina, and you could go over there and they would talk to you and they'd always ask me in the, in the small group, how's your quiet time going? And I think we today in the church need to become more responsible to each other and Hold each other accountable. How is your quiet time? Do you have one? And some of the time I'd almost lie because I hadn't had time. I wouldn't take the time. I have as much. Do you know what? You have 24 hours a day in the day, just like I do. The main thing is you make sure that during this time, you're going to have a time to listen to the one that created you in his own image and wants to have a relationship with you and to build closer and closer to him. The closer I get to him, the easier it is to live for him every day. Are there going to be storms? Oh, yes. There will be many storms in your life. But I want you to know he wants to step upon the deck of your heart and say, Peace, be still. And in his presence, in the quietness, there's times when I'm doing my exercises and I always count to all the things I'm doing because I do so many different things and I sometimes will be counting out loud and I just, there's a presence there and I don't count out loud anymore. I just do it in my mind because he's there. And I want to tell you that is one of the greatest joys is when he's present with you as an individual and he says you're special I want to tell you I want to tell all you children you're special to God he has a plan for your life a plan to help you to become all that he made you when he knit you in your mother's womb he had a plan there and if you will seek that plan he says you'll seek me and find me when you seek for me with all your heart are you seeking? If you are, the Father is very attentive. You know, he's the first one to create the wireless phone. He really was. He had it a long time before we did. And direct access to the Father because of the Son that died on the cross and be entered in once and for all for all of us to take the place that I should have had on that cross because he loved me so much, but he loves every one of you. And I don't care how deep into sin anybody has gone. I dealt with a situation just recently with a person that's having a hard time being able to feel like God could forgive him of what he had done. And I told him, I says, I want to tell you something. There's not a sin that's been committed that's bad enough that the blood of Christ cannot cleanse. That blood is powerful. I want to tell you that power, that blood is powerful. I remember the night when that power came into my life. I'd been fighting him. I could say all kinds of nasty things about God to other people. I could take his name in vain over and over and over. And that night, he took and cleansed a heart that was stained with all kinds of sin. If I'd have been living in the Old Testament, they could have probably stoned me to death for the things I had done. But God's blood through Jesus Christ flowed upon me that night and cleansed a heart and made it to where it craves God. And I hope your heart craves him because he craves your fellowship. I want to tell you that. This morning as I woke up, 
started walking over to the bathroom and God's voice said to me, go to the potter's wheel. Go to the potter's wheel. I'd, been, I'd wrote, written three sermons yesterday, tried to get one that I felt I could preach this morning. And last night I said, God, I don't feel very comfortable. You know what he said? Go to the potter's wheel. So I turned to Jeremiah. And you know what? This is a scripture there. Did I put it in the right order? I did, I think. It'll be up here on the screen in just a second. The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go down to the potter's shop and I will speak to you there. He spoke to me this morning. So I did as he told me and I found the potter working at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Is there anyone that needs him to start over? That's what he's saying to me this morning. And you know, not too long, about several years ago, this pastor had a daughter that was in a class of making clay pots and stuff. He says, my daughter today is going to be making a little bit of a uh, of, of pot or some kind of a, a pot of, made from clay. He says, if you folks would just like to watch her uh, do this, you can come over. So I went over there. And I watched her as she mixed the clay up and got it on that wheel there. And then she took her hands with the, the kind of whatever they used and began to form that clay. Watch, it comes up quite a ways and she had mixed it up very well, but the clay, there's a spot where it began to tear. And she couldn't make the pot that she wanted it to be. So she had to take and put the clay back. See, the potter can only do what the clay will allow him to do. And that's the same way with God and you. See, I'm clay. You're clay. He wants to make a pot out of you. It'll be probably maybe a crack pot. I don't know. Sometimes I think I'm a crack pot because I, must, I leak all the time. He keeps that. Fill it up. Fill it up. Fill it up. But I'm just saying, I'm just saying that God wants us to be so pliable in his hand. And that only happens when we fully surrender to him, that can only happen in the surrender of the clay into his hands and say, God, you can make out of me whatever you want to make out of me. Are you willing to be in the potter's hand? Let him to make you? Probably it'll be just a common, ordinary pot. That's what I am, just a common, ordinary pot. And I've got a leak somewhere because he has to keep filling and putting it in there. The same way with all of us. But young people, I want to tell you something. If you listen to God and do what he asks you to do and go by his book, many people are not going by the book today. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But he just spoke to my heart this morning about this. Becoming a, a, a piece of clay in the potter's hands that he can form out of it what he wants it to be. Are you willing? Am I willing? I have to surrender. I want to go now to Jesus because he's the one that I want to pattern my life after. Mark 135. Before day, daybreak, the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to the isolated place to pray. In the King James, it says he went out to the wilderness. The main thing is that Jesus had a time. And that's so important. You've got to have a time. And you have to make the time. The time won't just be there because the enemy is going to try to keep you 
from spending time in the presence of the Almighty. And so therefore, you have to say to him, I'm going to set me a time and I'm going to go by it. And if I can't do it at that time, I'm going to set a time later in the day when I can do it. If it has to be at 10 o'clock at night, it's better not doing it. But the main thing is that you say to God, I'm going to set a time and I'm going to have a time for you. Then he says, not only that, he found a place where there's not a lot of interruptions. And I know mothers, I want to tell you, I know mothers have a terrible time trying to find a time. Do you know what they said about uh, sister, uh, sister Wesley? She had how many children? It was a bunch. Huh? Twelve children? And you know what? She wore one of those big skirts, you know, and whenever they saw their mother with that pulled up over her head, they knew, don't you bother me because I'm talking to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and you better not stop anything from happening. And I want to tell you, mothers, it's important for you to be godly in the, pres in the presence of your family. It's not always easy. I saw my wife. I know some of the struggles a woman has. It's a struggle. She had a struggle with her husband. Does your wife have a struggle with you? Bill, are you sure? <laughs> I'm just saying this morning, I want us to realize the importance of prayer. I've appreciated Brother uh, Pastor Jerry's lead up to this morning and I hope I don't blow it too bad but I want to tell you our time alone with God is so important and the church will change whenever God can take and form us as a pot that he can use and I noticed in Romans there's a scripture there as well about the pot and how that it's so common and ordinary. You know, I think it was Abraham Lincoln said, that said, God must have loved just so common, ordinary people. He made so many of us. And I think that, you know, whenever we get the idea that we're something up here and other people are down here, we, we aren't talking to God. Because whenever we feel we're up here and people are down here, I want to tell you something. Some people say, well, I've gotten a long ways. Well, listen, I've lived for the Lord for, since 1950. If I haven't learned anything, I've been just kind of drifting. Any piece of uh, driftwood could go downstream with the world. But I want to tell you, whenever you want to go upstream, you have to have some power motor. I remember standing on the Hawthorne Bridge in Portland, Oregon. I was watching this uh, tugboat had a bunch of logs out behind it. It was tied together, a rope on logs around it, and then a whole bunch of logs he was taking up to the paper mill at Oregon City. And I watched him as that little old boat chugged along here and went up here. But I saw this other thing here, a piece of driftwood. And it was going downstream, going downstream like that. And I just thought, the Christian has to go against the world, and you have to have the power to go upstream. Because the Christian life is uphill. It's upstream. And if you're going to be a, the Christian God wants you to be, you're going to have to let him in charge, be in charge of your life. And when he got out to this place, Jesus, he prayed there. So it's important to have a quiet time. You know what? We're on a battlefield, not a playground. We're to be fishers of men, not keepers of an aquarium. That's important for us to understand. Now I kind of want to go to Nehemiah, a man of prayer. If you go there, you'll find in the first chapter, he begins to ask what's going on there. His brother comes back. Now this is a month of Kislev, which in the Greek is December. 
Nehemiah's brother came to Jerusalem with others, and he asked, How are things with the remnant who survived the exile about Jerusalem? They told him it's in great trouble, trouble and disgrace. The walls were broken down, and the gates have been burned with fire. And he says here, his first response was to sit down and to weep. I mourned and fasted and prayed. He didn't go to some seminar on how to build walls, which a lot of people today, if it happened, they'd have to find a seminar to go to how to build a wall, but he didn't. He went to God to find out the direction to go. And he established who God was, the great and the awesome God. He established who God God was. God is the God of the heaven who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. He said it several times in the 14th chapter of John. 15th verse, the 21st verse, the 23rd verse. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. I think it's Beth Moore that I listened to on the book of James. She says over and over in that book, if you believe it, you'll live it. You don't really believe it if you're not putting it into practice, is what she said over and over in that study of James. And do you know what James says? I'm a bond servant, which means I'm a slave. To Jesus Christ and that's what he wants from all of us he acted very wickedly towards us you know it says and he began to pray his prayer was a prayer was a prayer of confession I confess the sins that we Israelites including myself my father's house have committed against you we have acted very wickedly towards you we have not obeyed your command you gave to your servant Moses I want you to notice he doesn't blame anybody else. You know when Adam and Eve was in the garden and they got through and, you know, uh, God came and says, Adam, where are you? I want you to notice he called for the man. Where are you? Well, that woman, you know, and he says, well, we're naked. How do you know you're naked? Have you, seen, have you eaten of that tree? Oh, yes, we've eaten of that tree, and that's a problem. But he says, you know, Lord, that woman you gave me, started passing the blame on to her. And then Eve says, well, you know that serpent you made? And I don't know what the serpent did. And I don't know what it said. All I know is that whenever God, he wants us to be willing to look at ourselves, the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror, the child in the mirror, and see where you're at, where you're going, where you're headed. If I continue on the road that I'm on, where will I wind up on at the end? And that's so important for us to really take a value of that and look at our times. Have we got any broken down walls today in America? Immorality seems to be rampant today. Young people saying it's okay to start living together rather than marry. I remember asking a couple, well, why not marry? And they said to me, said, marriage don't work. See, they're watching all the people and divorce rates so high, about 50, 50, 50 make it, 50 don't. Or in some places they say it's even higher than that. But I'm telling you, marriage will work. God's the one that created it. Marriage will work. But you have to work at it. It's not easy. Now, you know, I've told you some things about my wife and I, you know. You know there's things that don't work, go right. So what I say is, talk to God about it. He knows all about it. I'm not here to condemn anyone. I just want you to have a successful journey through life. Young people, listen to me. If you'll go by the book here 
and hear what it says, I want to tell you, you'll have a successful life. But if you break this, the, the rules that are in this book, you'll have a life that will destroy you as an individual. See, I want to build a hedge. You know, there's a kind of a cliff here for these young people I watch. I remember as being a young person. And when you get up to about 12, 13, 14, Oh, I became so smart. I knew it all. And my parents were so dumb. My five siblings before me hadn't educated them at all and got them to think right. But you know what? When I got to be 21, I sat down with a pen and a, pen, a paper, piece of paper and wrote my parents a note and told them, I'm sorry for the way I treated you while I was growing up. I was amazed at how smart they got in those few years there. I was just amazed. But I want to tell you something. I wish somebody told me, listen, someday you're going to have some children yourself. What do you want for them? And I would encourage you young people to realize someday if you marry, you're going to have some children probably. And they're going to get to be 12, 13, 14, even up to 17, 18, 19. And they're going to think you're so dumb, so stupid. But I want to tell you something. Those parents love you. And the reason they do what they do is because they care. I don't care who they are, who you are. They care. I wanted, You know what I wanted for my children? I wanted the very best for every one of them. And I know that's what you want. But we've got a lot of broken down walls today. And I pray. Now, the government's not going to solve our problem. I just want you to know that. They're all they're going to do is fight. Isn't that what we're hearing now, today? That's all they're doing. Listen, they're not going to solve the problem. You know who's going to solve the problems that we face is God. And we better talk to him about it. I know of people that think it's okay to have sex before marriage. But I want to tell you something. It's important to keep your body to give it to the one that you say I do and I will with and you'll be glad you did the last wedding I helped with in my family was a grandson and I'll never forget I had the privilege of reading the vows to them and then we got through with the vows and came down to the time for them to kiss that was the first time this couple had kissed was on their wedding day. You say there must be something wrong with them. No. They were smart. Because it's important to hold yourself responsible because someday you're going to say yes to somebody, I'll marry you. And whenever you say that, commit to say, I'm going to live it out till death do us. And if you haven't, that's okay. Just go from where you are. Take plan B. God has that other plan for you. And just be faithful to do what he asks you to do in that. I want to tell a story in closing my message today. There was an old Indian that went to church one Sunday because his life had kind of been shambles. He has been drinking a lot, alcoholic, and so... He went to church this Sunday morning and he went down to the altar and said to God, I'll give you my horse's bridle. So he prayed and went back to his seat. That didn't seem to satisfy him. So he went back up to the altar and he says, well, Lord, I'll give you my saddle. And he prayed a little bit and he went back to his seat and that didn't satisfy him either. So he finally said, 
Lord, I'll give you my horse. As he's at the altar, and then that didn't satisfy. Finally, he went back to the altar and said, I'll give you the Indian. And that's what God wants from you and I. He wants the Indian. Does he have the Indian as far as you're concerned? Have you given him everything of your life? Down here on the, there, and you'll see it on the screen up here in just a minute. The deed to my life. You know what? Have you ever taken the time to sit down and say, God, I give you the deed, deed to my life? Back a few years ago, we got some information on stewardship and stuff, and this was in it, and we put it out in the bulletin, and I took and signed that. And I dated it that then, but I'd done it a long time before. But as you read that up there, I don't know if you can read it. There's some down here. And I'll get a copy of it, and I'll read it to you so you'll know what it says. The deed to my life. I recognize Almighty God as the source, creator, and owner of all that I have, all that I am, and all that I hope to be. Therefore, I willingly give everything back to him, my time, my talent, my treasure, and my touch. I am willing to allow him to use me, all of me, as he sees fit. Um, we made enough copies for every one of you to have one of them if you like. I well, put them down here on the front here. And I didn't put any pens there, but if you need a pen, I'll loan you one of mine so you can sign it. I lost a pen the other night out at the uh, sock hop by let somebody use it and I think it got in the pens it was brought back and one of my special pens I love pen but no we don't have pens but I want to tell you something I believe God wants you to give the deed of your life to him I believe that with all my heart no matter what the past has been I believe with all my heart that I can give him the deed to my life. 